I think so. It's clear. So you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, okay, let me see. There's some uh, chat is over here. Okay, it's yes. All right, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending this uh, uh, seminar. And, uh, and I thank you again for the uh, for Professor Drew and all the organizers uh, to uh, uh, have this uh, very uh, uh, very interesting uh, and uh, uh, very uh, attractive uh, symposium. So I, um, in line with the topic of this uh, symposium, I would like to present the uh, uh, petroleum production related uh, topic for this. Uh, Belt and Road uh, 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 Symposium. So I'm gonna present the role of geomechanics in petroleum production in Xinjiang oil fields. As we know that Xinjiang is not uh, only famous in cotton, it is also very famous in, their, in petroleum resources. Um, I'm gonna present uh, um, two types of uh, uh, res uh, uh, petroleum resources in Xinjiang oil field. Now let's look at the uh, uh, Xinjiang oil fields for those who are not familiar with China. So I'm, uh, I'm using this map to show you their major oil fields in China. Uh, Xinjiang is in the northern part, it's northern western part, and it's a key point for the Belt and Road uh, program. And the Xinjiang oil fields was located there in the in the uh, Jungar Basin. So all the oil fields what I present here in this presentation is in the uh, Jungar Basin, and uh, this is uh, one of the major oil fields in China. In this place, we have mainly two types of uh, petroleum resources. The first is the uh, tighter oil, which is trapped in the tight glutenite. And uh, for this type of oil, uh, the permeability is very low and the uh, buried depth is very, very deep. You can uh, see, I used to here is more than 4,000 meters. And the permeability of low, uh, low permeability because of the rich in uh, uh, lomonite, which is a kind of uh, tight mineral it has a, a very rich uh, clay bound water. So the, uh, the permeability is very low. Another type of uh, petroleum resource is oil sands. Uh, it is a type of heavy oil. It, the, uh, the viscosity is very high and uh, we have to use special technology to uh, produce the uh, petroleum resources. Uh, by contrast, this type of uh, petroleum resource is very shallowly buried. It's around 500 to five, uh, 400 to 500 meters. So it's, uh, it's compared to 4,000 meters, it's very shallow, but still we need some uh, special technology to produce it. And so those two type of resources, one is them in Mahusak, another is a uh, Kormai oil field. I'm gonna use examples to show you the special technology to produce uh, petroleum resources. Um, for the first type of deep oil, we usually have to use hydraulic fracturing technology to um, break the rock and increase the permeability and uh, produce the, uh, the tight, oil, tight oil over there. While the major risk related to this type of hydraulic fracturing is the uh, injection induced earthquake. It is also common for some other tighter uh, geo resources like shale gas and also related in geothermal production in their deep geothermal engineering. So for this type of hydraulic fracturing, when we inject a high pressure fluid, so the fluid to transmit into the fault zone, the fault can be activated because of the fracture of uh, hydraulic fracturing behavior. So we have to try the best to, to reduce the injection pressure to prevent the injection induced earthquake. And from your heavy oil sands, we use another type of uh, 
uh, technology, which is steam assisted uh, gravity drainage technology. It was originally developed in Canada for Alberta oil science production. In a sac D, we basically inject a high temperature fluid like steam into well the pipe and to reduce the viscosity of the heavy oil. And because of the gravity, oil will drain to another production well and will be pumped out. So for this type of technology, the risk is the cap rock integrity because we inject high, high temperature fluid and if the pressure is very high, it can destroy the cap rock and break the uh, cap rock and uh, induce some, uh, destroy the surroundings. If workers are around, they can be killed. So basically this is, uh, this is potentially to bring some uh, uh, disaster so we have to use our, our disciplines in geomechanics to prevent this kind of uh, disaster from happening. So for all those two types of uh, technology or petroleum production activities, we have to make use of geomechanics to reduce the risk. How to reduce the risk? Of course, we have to uh, uh, geomechanics has already been involved because when we drill, when we inject, when the rock was break down, geome geomechanics is there. So the thing is, how can we make use of geomechanics to reduce such risk? We propose our approach to reduce their, their uh, production related to risk, which is to use rock dilation to enhance permeability. So rock dilation, Basically, for those two types of rocks, the first type of rock, uh, the brittle one, dilation comes from the sliding of the fracture. So this uh, deeply buried rock is a uh, kind of brittle. Then if there's some uh, natural fracture, you inject. So the uh, displaced, shear displacement will create some opening there and the opening will become the flow channel to enhance the permeability. Thus, the permeability can be enhanced, then the production rate will be increased. So the, um, this is uh, to enhance the production and try the best to reduce the injection pressure. If by the contrast, if we purely inject a high pressure fluid, keep on injecting and uh, uh, create uh, opening, which induce tensile fracturing, it can also create some opening to, uh, to increase the uh, permeability. But this is tensile fracturing, which require very high injection pressure. So very high injection pressure means it, it will bring some risk of induced uh, earthquakes. So for another type of rock for the oil sands one, similar mechanism is here. The shear can induce some dilation but it's because of the green rearrangement of the oil sands particle. So when there's some shear displacement, their, their openings was created because of their particle rearrangement, then that can create some uh, permeability enhancement. So dilation comes from shearing. That's what we can expect. In terms of the stress spring curve, I'm gonna use this uh, plots to show more specifically how the uh, shear can induce dilation and uh, uh, create some opening to increase the permeability. Here is the typical stress strain curve. When we have the uh, traction test on any soil or, or rock sample, we have the shear stress and the shear strain curve here. When we have the uh, stress increase, and try to touch some point before the peak, but we touch the yielding point, there's a transition from tra contraction to dilation. So the dilation start from the yielding point and because of the dilation, the volumetric strain become negative. Usually we treat the expansion as negative. So when there's some volume increase, 
the uh, prosody increase, the permeability increase. If we look at effective stress pass in this PQ space, which is effective stress pass and uh, shear stress, P and Q space, at the initial point, which is the, uh, determined from in situ stress measurement, uh, usually we have to carry out some uh, in situ stress measurement based on mini fracturing test or some other uh, approach. We have to get in situ stress point, then we start inject because, because when we inject, the pore pressure cannot be dissipated uh, very quickly. So it's kind of undrained shearing behavior. So the effective stress pass is going this way. Try to touch the yield envelope and have some yielding. Of course, the yielding envelope has to be determined based on the laboratory testing of their geomaterial. For example, we carry out their laboratory tests to measure the, the strength and determine the yield envelope. This is the way to create shear yielding or shear dilation. But usually, as a petroleum engineers in the petroleum engineering, people just to try to inject as more as they can. They inject a fluid, a high pressure fluid in a very high rate and directly create the tensile fracturing. They didn't touch the shear yielding. They go directly to the tensile part and create tensile fracturing. Of course, the permeability can be increased, but this will bring the risk of uh, tensile fracturing. So what we need to do is to control the injection pressure to create dilation, but should be below the tensile fraction behavior. It should be below the tensile fraction pre uh, pressure, which is to reduce the risk. So I'm gonna use two examples to illustrate how can we make use of a shear dilation to, uh, to uh, reduce the risk of uh, earthquake and also to reduce the risk of our caparotic failure. Uh, the first example is the tight oil reservoir uh, in the Mahu sack, like uh, what I presented uh, in the previous picture. The first thing is to uh, measure the uh, in situ stress. It is based on some open hole mini fracture testing system. I'm, I'm not gonna present the detailed measurement here, but there the major principle in geomechanics to, is to inject fluid, then core stop, then shut down the whole of the, the borehole and the monitor the pressure dissipation. Based on the observation, we can uh, determine the horizontal minimum horizontal stress and also determine the uh, maximum uh, horizontal stress based on poor elastic analysis. We have some paper to, uh, to uh, present the details. Another thing is to measure the uh, rock properties based on laboratory testing, and then modeling. Uh, firstly, we have to collect the rock samples and carry out the structure test using our structure testing machine. Here, I use the G GCTS system to illustrate the, uh, some measurements which is based on different confining pressure. We can see here the Q and uh, the shear stress and actual strain curve um, is measured here. A typical strain hardening behavior can be observed. Uh, here we can see the volumetric strain curve is also measured and we use some of um, our finite element uh, modeling. We can, uh, we can uh, match over model results with the mayor results. I'm, I'm gonna present something more interesting here, which is uh, the uh, permeability measurement at different stress levels. Basically at different uh, uh, string, at different stress levels, we carry out the uh, permeability test. We can measure the permeability change when the stress at, is uh, imposed at different levels. Uh, here, when the stress is close to the peak, we can observe the permeability got a very strong enhancement. 
when there's a dilation behavior, because when you have contraction, then there's a transition point, the, the permeability increase all of a sudden. This is because of shear dilation, because it is before the peak. So based on this behavior, we can develop the permeability and the porosity relation um, between, um, between this relation, we can um, tell compaction and their uh, dilation as different their stage. So we basically write this behavior into abacus based on user-defined field programming. And then the permeability and their porosity and their plastic strain can be related. Here I have the uh, two uh, plot, several plots to illustrate the uh, plastic strain, hydraulic conductivity at different stress levels. What we can observe here is that at low strain, we have small amount of plastic spring and uh, uh, lower conductivity. But as the actual strain is more than 1.2%, you can see typical shear band here, which create a very strong permeability enhancement here. This is in their laboratory level. But in the field level, similar story, we carry out some uh, fully coupled numeric modeling and for this, for this ge uh, geological reservoir, we have a vertical wearable here. When we inject the high pressure fluid, it will create some fracture. I present this some uh, results based on two approach. The first one is the c -frac. It is conventional fracturing approach. This is basically we inject a high amount of fluid in a very high rate, very high pressure in a very short period, create a fracture. The defracturing is the new approach we propose. Basically, we inject some uh, fluid in a slower rate. And uh, basically, we are trying to create some uh, dilation, shear plastic zones around the well. So you can see that the porosity of void ratio here based on the dilation approach, it is much larger. The zone is much larger than the conventional approach. So this will increase the production rate, but uh, it's based on the, uh, the uh, improved approach. So the injection pressure is much lower than the conventional or fraction approach. When the injection pressure is lower, the risk of uh, inducing our uh, earthquake is uh, lower. Well, uh, I use another figure to illustrate how the uh, dilation zone was created. Basically, at the first stage, there's there's some um, reservoir uh, penetration. Then, when we create the rock dilation, that is the reservoir dilation, then we create some dilation zone. Those dilation zone will become the fluid pathway, which will increase the uh, permeability. So that's why the uh, petroleum production rate can be enhanced. Now I'm going to use another example, which is also to illustrate how the how does the dilation can um, increase the uh, um, permeability and uh, increase the uh, production rate. It is for all sense. As we know, oil sands, the, uh, it's rich in bitumen. The bitumen, the viscosity is very low, is very, very, very high. So the, uh, the production rate is very low if we use common approach because it's very difficult to produce petroleum from this, um, from this kind of a reservoir. We have to use some thermal approach. For conventional uh, thermally enhanced recovery, just the one injector and one producer, which is to inject the steam and produce petroleum and the, the water from the bottom hole, from the bottom well. But the, what we propose is that we can create some dilation zone around two wells. How to create dilation is to inject some hot water in some amount of injecting pressure to create some dilation zone first. 
So we carry out their in situ stress measurement first and carry out the laboratory testing based on their uh, traditional approach, like your traction testing system. And uh, based on the measurement, we can, uh, we can have the uh, stress property and the right into uh, our constituent modeling tool to simulate the plastic string behavior. And the same thing, we write the program into Abacus to we can simulate the plastic string and the permeability enhancement. Here, I use this graph to illustrate how can we carry out the uh, uh, dilation start, startup. It's a little bit different with conventional cyclic process. We have vertical well and the horizontal wells. Uh, basically, we inject the hot water to be around the injector. Before we inject steam, we inject hot water in some of the stress level, which is a little bit higher uh, than the in situ stress. Then we can create some uh, shear dilation around the well to create some high porosity zones. So when the porosity was created, the plastic strain was created, then we move on to inject uh, steam. Again, we carry out the uh, numerical modeling. Here, I don't, I don't need to uh, present the detailed constitute laws and the complicated, uh, not highly nonlinear governing equations. Instead, I just present some results. When we inject uh, steam, the simulation is uh, very complicated. It cannot be conducted just uh, using abacus because abacus can only deal with a uh, single phase flow for the uh, uh, fluid flow like uh, the petroleum resources. The, it is a multi-phase flow and the uh, temperature and the phase change, all kind of issues there. So we have to rely on some uh, reservoir simulator like uh, CMG. And uh, we carry out some numerical modeling. We couple those two tools together because abacus is very strong in dealing with solid mechanics. Uh, the converged speed is very high to deal with the uh, solid mechanics, especially when there's some plasticity. But the CMG is very strong in dealing with uh, multi-phase flow because uh, it is using finite difference and a finite volume approach. It is not uh, based on finite element method. So we couple those two. Uh, to be noted, uh, those two uh, simulator, they have different mesh because uh, they are based on different numerical approach. So when we have the numerical modeling, there's some iterative approach. Basically, we calculate one step, then core stop, and transfer stress to uh, and pressure to uh, the another tool, then calculate the uh, reservoir part. After the reservoir part was completed, then pressure will go back to uh, abacus to uh, update the effective stress. So the uh, calculation is very slow. So we have to rely on supercomputers in order to complete this kind of job. Uh, here I present some results to illustrate how the uh, results are different. Uh, figure A is the, uh, is the result based on the, uh, uh, based on the uh, dilation approach. You can see that the temperature has been expanded to more influencing zones. So the production rate will be highly increased. But for the traditional one without safety dilation, you see the temperature influencing domain is much lower than the, the upgraded one. We also have some uh, field uh, monitoring approach. We have uh, sensors in the field to uh, monitor the uh, production, the temperature, all the stuff have confirmed that your dilation approach is very effective. So now I want to draw some summary. The first, the shear dilation give a very strong enhancement for rock permeability, no matter for the deep laminate rich glutenite formation or the shallow or sense formation. It is very effective. And the impact of our reservoir compaction and dilation on the well production should be properly considered because 
Compaction will decrease the permeability, but dilation will increase and enhance the permeability. So it will bring us more economic issues. And uh, if we uh, reduce injection pressure and end up with the same production rate, so we will be on the safe side. It is uh, eco and uh, environmental friendly. So this is to uh, this is a new way to uh, um, reduce the risk of uh, for injection induced earthquake or capital rock integrity problem. While the uh, proactive utilization of geomechanics in Xinjiang oil fields can also be a good examples for other oil fields because Xinjiang oil fields I use two type of reservoirs. So in other reservoirs like uh, shale gas and also other, other petroleum reservoirs, this kind of approach can also be used. It can also be used for gas hydrate production and also geothermal production. Hopefully this kind of technology can be expanded uh, to our other reservoirs in other countries along the belt and road there. Uh, the route. So if you want to learn more about the uh, procedure and details of the approach, so you can go to those four publications and uh, look for the details and theories or reference related to our uh, presentation. Uh, finally, I would like to thank you uh, very much for your attention and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge you the organizers and also the uh, sponsors of our project. And uh, I would like to acknowledge your University of Calgary for providing the some software su uh, support and also Purdue Canada for sharing the data in the field. And also we have to um, rely on the supercomputers by Vast Grid and Compute Canada. Without the strong support, we cannot complete our uh, such a huge numerical modeling uh, work. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very glad to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, you have given us a very, uh, very interesting uh, <coughs> presentation. Uh, <coughs> I, uh, I'm doing research on uh, soil mechanics, but uh, for rock mechanics, uh the there are many many more uh, complicated problems to solve uh, you just mentioned about uh, the numerical simulations right we we uh we have many <coughs> uh issues to be uh solved such as uh, uh the cracking uh, of, of rocks and the you said uh, the shear dilation uh, phenomena is very also very hard to simulate um okay uh is there any uh, questions uh hello dr lee uh, hello dr is, yeah i'm Dr. from shanto university china yeah yeah I'm very glad to see you here it's mm -hmm. a very interesting presentation and uh, i'm very thankful to you for sharing your research thank you very much yeah, I just want to know, I mean, uh, is there any, uh, because uh, for Xinjiang, specifically you're talking about like oil sands, and then there's uh, deep dried oil. So, I mean, for the soils in Xinjiang, do you have any particular uh, trigeal testing, or some data or results from the trigeal test that you have done on the different stress path? and any constitutive model development in that direction. Because mm -hmm. I think for, sh for shale gas, I, I can see there is a lot of research in China now going on, uh, specifically with respect to this THM thermohydro uh, mechanical coupling. So with respect to Xinjiang, you have any constitutive model development or in that direction? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Basically, you are um, you, know, you are interested in seeing more data in the constitutive modeling of the geomaterials in Xinjiang. Yes. Is that right? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, the um, the only uh, 
data would we hold, uh, first one is the, um, the glutonite, which is the deeply buried rock. We, we did the, it's the first time we did the uh, constitutive modeling for that type of a rock. It is a string hardening behavior. For the oil sands, um, we, we also are, I think we are the, among the first uh, uh, group to uh, carry out the constitutive modeling of the uh, oil sands. Um, it compared to uh, the oil sands in Canada, Xinjiang oil fields have very different behavior. And it's, uh, it's because the buried depth is, is uh, deeper than their Canadian oil sands. But there are some, uh, something similar because they are all uh, oil sands. So if, um, if um, we want to see more uh, behavior like oil sands, I would like to recommend the uh, more papers published by their professors in the University of Calgary. Uh, they have quite a lot of publications on oil sands. So, but for Xinjiang, they are very limited, very limited uh, data on that. And we, yeah. I think we are among the first group to mm -hmm. publish this type of our continued modeling. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. Because I think uh, this kind of sense, uh, if you're talking about very deep, uh, their behavior, I mean, they could have very unique features depending on the region where it's located. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next question. Yes, I have one small question. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. uh, dear Dr. Lee, Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about induced seismicity. Yeah. And how, what uh, do you think about uh, which magnitude can occur uh, during uh, this, uh, 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 as induced seismicity? Which magnitude can uh, occur? How much magnitude, magnitude of induced seismicity? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is a very, a very important point and a very, very interesting topic. Um, recently, in U.S., in our, in our border, in Canada, and also even in Korea, and also in some part in China, uh, there are some induced uh, seismic, uh, seismic uh, activities. It ranges from, I think, from um, low to uh, Five point something, the magnitude can be as high as uh, five, so, uh, five to six. So some of the activities uh, can be due to their injection. And also um, because this is kind of related to our petroleum production. So it, it, is, uh, it is very hard to say, but there's somebody uh, report uh, such kind of activity um, in a butter. There's a recent paper by uh, uh, Dr. David Eaton, who published in Science. Uh, he reported the, the um, induced the seismic activities in our butter, and uh, he concluded it's because of the injection. And uh, I remember the uh, the highest uh, uh, magnitude can be six, can be five to six. So for this kind of magnitude, it has been strong, I believe. It, it can destroy a lot of buildings. And there, there are also some activity in Korea because of geothermal production, I guess. Maybe last year or two years ago, I, I, I learned that. Um, in, in China, in, uh, uh, in Sichuan province, people report there are some uh, seismic activity. Uh, these, they claim it can be because of the injection, but it's hard to say because we have one China earthquake, which is a huge one, and uh, we cannot conclude it's because of injection. But uh, I think people are still studying this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ne next question. Well, maybe let I one <laughs> another. Uh, when you uh, get oil, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah. Instead of, uh, usually instead of oil, we eject the salted water, uh, heavy salted water. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of uh, water you propose to eject uh, instead of oil? Uh, you mean which which type of uh, water I propose to inject? Uh, we get oil. Uh, yeah. And uh, we have some pores and uh, uh, holes, and we need to put instead of oil uh, another uh, another uh, things. No, let's say. Uh, salted water, heavy water, heavy water. Heavy water. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of water you proposed to eject instead of oil in the uh, rock soils? I uh, basically it's um it's a uh, it, it depends on the uh, reservoir formation. For for example, if we have some uh, sensitive formation which is uh, rich in swelling clay. We uh, we propose. I think the uh, the salted water is uh, is needed instead of fresh water. And uh, uh, in in terms of drilling, uh, the the uh, somebody used the potassium based fluid and somebody used the oil based. So in terms of drilling, I think the oil based is there is to be on the safe side. But uh, if if we use the uh, potassium salted based. Uh, it can be. It can also be used to uh, to prevent the swelling behavior of the clay minerals. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but uh, we we shouldn't use the fresh water. Uh, it, it happens. It always happens in drilling engineering. If we use fresh water to drill in some uh, sensitive formation like uh, uh, bentonite, or uh, some formation which are rich in bentonite seams, so injection will break, uh, we'll have a lot of issues. So we have to use uh, either salted water or the um, uh, oil-based, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see some uh, students from Kazakhstan have also joined, and also uh, Dr. Asil. Does anybody have questions? I mean, that would be good. Good morning. I think this talk, yeah, Dr. Asil. Yeah, good morning. Because I think this topic is quite relevant for Central Asia also. Uh, I think, uh, especially Kazakhstan, a lot of oil resources. Uh, so, okay. let I note uh, it is very interesting presentation, and uh, of course, uh, I am waiting uh, the copy of that one for us, and uh, I hope uh, we can uh, cooperate in uh, this uh, field with uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very nice experience to share our experience here because um, we want to, uh, because the usually uh, petroleum engineers, they know very little about their geomechanics and they just want to produce, produce and bring some environmental issue and also disaster. As a geotechnical, geotechnical engineer, we, we try to connect with the petroleum engineer and try to make use of what we have to reduce such, such risk. That is the uh, major obstacle and our aim. So I think to uh, make use of geomechanics to reduce the disaster uh, is the major, major goal for the coming decades. So because the uh, geothermal, all kinds of energies are promising and uh, I think geomechanics will be more important. Dr. Lee, I have a small question. Yes, yeah. Um, 
I know uh, in uh, some uh, countries such as Japan, uh, yeah. people will use the the uh, novel fiber optic monitoring technology uh, to monitor the whole process uh, of uh, oil production. Uh, do you have any uh, experience uh, related to this issue? And uh, can you give us some uh, introduction? Uh, yeah, uh, for the uh, in the petroleum industry or in the energy industry, they um, they are keeping on upgrading their uh, technology to monitor the, your, the the petroleum production and also related their uh, changes of the ground. So from my perspective. I am um, because I'm in their uh, North America. I, I am watching the uh, uh, the developing development of the petroleum industry in U.S., which is uh, much more ahead before Canada. What I observe that the the fiber optimum sensor is playing a very important role now. They are trying all the companies. They are trying to adopt this uh, technology. They try to put into their a uh, well logging technology to uh, to measure the uh, for instance even the temperature the uh, stream uh, the acoustic uh, signals all kinds of our uh, uh, signal they, they are trying to uh, involve it um, from what i learned is that um, people are trying to carry out their numerical modeling meanwhile uh, for example in the finite element their simulation at different nodes, they put their fiber there, simulate a fiber there, and uh, carry out some simulation to our, to our, uh, because at FEM we deal with uh, solid mechanics, but in the meanwhile, uh, we add one more physics, which is acoustic signals. Then, uh, then we can simulate uh, such behavior. So in the field, we will collect more uh, data as training samples. So uh, I think this is a very promising area, but it's a very difficult area. So I, I, I think it's in the coming uh, couple of years, more people will be involved in this area. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think uh, uh, the uh, optical fiber can uh, measure, uh, for example, the in influencing zoom of uh, uh, the, the, the production uh, process. And, uh, but uh, I think uh, the most uh, uh, difficult problem is uh, how to ensure uh, the measuring uh, accuracy because mm -hmm. uh, there are many uh, materials uh, combined together. So it's hard to identify uh, what uh, the strain measurement means, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. The, to interpret the signal is, I think, it will be very challenging. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Okay. Is there any other questions? Okay. If if no, I think. Uh, uh, it, it, this will be end of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for for giving us uh, this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and the uh, next presentation will start uh, at uh, eleven o'clock. So please uh, stay for a while uh, to uh, to listen to the, another uh, lecture. Thank you all for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank okay, you, Dr. See you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. So, I'm gonna, because uh, I'm 11 at night, so I'm very <laughs> glad to see everybody here. And mm -hmm. it's my honor to be here. And uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the time and their attention. So, very happy to be here, to be a member. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Lee. I look forward to more co collaborations between us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for Bye. sure. I'm looking forward to get more collaborations in the near future. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, Dr. Lee, Professor yes. Chu of uh, Shanto University, Professor Abraham Chu.
uh, uh -huh. we have also joined. He he works he worked in uh, I think shale gas. Uh, oh, okay. Constitutive modeling. Uh, so oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So Professor, yeah. Professor Chiu, are you? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I just want to clarify. I'm working on gas hydrate. Gas hydrate. Yeah. Yeah. Gas hydrate. I see. Yeah. I see. About the uh, modeling, modeling of the uh, gas hydrate sediment. Okay. But it's just uh, an initial stage. Uh -huh. Maybe we can discuss more in the future. Yeah, 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 sure. So uh, which, uh, which numerical tools are you using to simulate? Uh, at this moment, I am using, actually my, my student is using uh, uh, console. Are you using console? Yeah. That's yeah. But this, uh, the computation time is uh, very, uh, very low. <laughs> very yes. high. Yeah. So we I, yeah, we're talking about just uh, one dimensional modeling first. So not okay. yet go to three dimensional. Yeah. Okay, great. Because I'm working on another research topic is a frozen soil, uh, which is also fully coupled the problem. I, we are developing our new uh, own numerical tools to simulate. Uh, we we use COMSO as well because of the um, uh, weakness of dealing with uh, plasticity. So we, we 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 turn to another numerical tool. But we know the strength of our COMSO. But uh, the major limitation, I guess, is the uh, the speed. That's what you so what, yeah. what constitutive model you are using for for COMSO now? Uh, the, the time clay can be a, it's a traditional one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I know uh, they build in the CAMK model. But yeah. for us, uh, there is a limitation for CAMK to model the sandy material. So that's why we are, we are thinking to uh, incorporate a, a new constituting model in, in COMSO. But it's yeah. a long way to go. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's a necessary but challenging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can discuss more. Yeah, sure. In the future, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, see you everybody. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Mm -hmm. Hello, Professor Adi Sarma. Oh, hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm good. I'm good. So it's the uh, afternoon in uh, New Zealand, right? Yeah, it's uh, almost three o'clock. Uh, it's about, yeah, 10 to 3 now. 
Okay. Okay. Nice. It's about biochar. So it's biochar. I mean, your presentation is about biochar cement and mix. Yeah, it's about. Uh, um, what time? What time are we starting? Uh, it's, uh, I think in a few minutes, maybe around. Okay. So minutes. yeah. Yeah, it's um, application of biochar in non-soil related, you know, activities, uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> How much time do I have? About 40 minutes? 40, 45? Yeah, yeah, yeah 40, 45. Okay. So are you in China or in India? Uh, still in India. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can't go to, go back to China now, isn't it? <laughs> It's becoming difficult. <laughs> it's because mm. of uh, no, I have applied visa, but I think they are not issuing visa yet for uh, some countries. Mm. Mm. How are the situation in China? I think it's quite good. Um, they have they 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 have uh, face to face classes since last semester already. Last oh, semester okay. was also face to face. <clears throat> even this semester is also face to face. Right. Only okay. foreign teachers who are not able. To come back, uh, they ask us to teach online, mm -hmm. but uh, in in China itself, uh, I think everything is completely fine. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so, how's the thing? I think New Zealand also quite okay. I, I, yeah, everything is normal here. Um, we've been teaching in uh, lecture theatre. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, this is uh, term break. Uh, uh, second half of the second semester will start Monday again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not bad so far, but you know, most of the people who come from overseas, um, they get tested at the border, at the yes, airport. Yes, that's good. That's and um, so, you know, we often get people coming from India, they test positive, so that's why they have banned. <laughs> Now yeah, flights yeah, coming from I, India. I heard, I heard from India. I mm. The situation mm. in India now not good. Mm, um, exactly. I can see even in my society around me. Mm. Uh, I'm near Delhi now, but even in my society where I'm living, it's already 40. You, you, you are in which city? And now I'm living in Delhi. Yeah, near Delhi, good now. Oh, near, near, near in Delhi. Okay, Delhi must be yeah. bad, isn't it? Yeah, not good. Not good now. Mm. It, it was quite know, okay last few months. I know this guy, what's his name? Sanandam. He has gone mm -hmm. back to India, apparently. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He's, uh, he told me that, you know, I probably I'll have to think about when, I, when do I go back again.
Hi, Professor uh, Sarum. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm Hong Hu Zhu from Nanjing University. Uh, okay. Some of my uh, colleagues are also uh, doing research related to Bai Cha. So they say that you, you have done very uh, excellent uh, work in this area. So today it's, it's very honor for us to uh, invite you to give us an invite lecture. Sure, thank you. So can I start now? Uh, I think, uh, yes, the time is uh, 11 o'clock. So please, uh, yeah, uh, start your presentation. All right, so um, first of all, uh, a good morning to you. I think it's, uh, what's the time now? Must be about 11 o'clock now in China? Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So very good morning to all of you. This is uh, about 3 p.m. in New Zealand. Beautiful day today, it's about 22 degrees Celsius maximum. We are in the autumn now. It's getting cooler now, <clears throat> evening. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you uh, a bit about uh, some of my uh, work. Uh, this is part of one larger projects where we are looking at uh, mixing biochar with uh, cement and mortars. And, and then we want to see uh, what kind of you know, strength we get uh, and other different properties, how we can test. So this is basically going from traditional way of applying uh, as a soil amendment. Biochar is often used for soil amendment, contaminant remediation. So we want to look at how you can apply this uh, particular material uh, in other sectors like you know, construction and uh, building industry. So give you a bit of outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a bit of background. Uh, what is the overarching objective or aim of my work? Uh, some materials and methods, and we'll talk about some of the results and discuss some of them. And uh, what's the significance, environmental significance, anything we do in the lab or in the field, it must have some uh, implications or significance associated with it. I have, often people, they don't tend to bother about writing in their write journal articles, but environmental significance or environmental implication of the work is extremely important because if you do something in the lab and then you prove a concept, you know, a certain concept, you know, you have demonstrated in the lab, if you can, can't take it to the real uh, situation uh, that doesn't make much sense. It's good to understand a lot of the things that we do in the lab, you know, fundamentals. So, and then finally, we'll just give you a summary or conclusion of my work. <clears throat> so, I mean, everybody knows, I don't need to, you know, go through this slide here, uh, how atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration has been increasing over the years. Uh, if you look at this is a plot, you know, to carbon dioxide concentration as a function of time over the years. And uh, was quite uh, uh, staggering if you look at you know if early period of the Earth you know you know to two hundred thousand BCE you know it's going up and down you know it was hovering between about two hundred to you know about two hundred eighty now uh, current global atmospheric carbon dioxide emission is nearly four hundred ten uh, parts per million that is unbelievable and it, it is only going to actually exponentially increase, that's a big problem. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, or, or some people, you know, they don't tend to actually know. Uh, I know that global emissions have increased from 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide back in 1900. So 1900, we are sitting somewhere, you know, here. And then now 2018, uh, 2021 now, this is the data up to 2018. It's gone up to more than 36 billion tons in 2018. So it must have crossed about 40 billion tons now. I don't know. I don't have the exact figure. But the global carbon dioxide emission that comes from cement industry, it's unbelievable. It is seven to eight percent of the global carbon dioxide emission comes from cement industry. Because to be able to produce cement, you have to burn lime, right? So in the process of burning lime, you emit you know, carbon dioxide. So, which is quite second. And also we don't, we're not even talking about the construction and demolition waste here, which is a different issue altogether. That's also quite challenging uh, because segregation of construction and demolition waste uh, is a bit of a problem because it got a mixture of a lot of different things. 
So, uh, so that is the main issue, like seven to eight percent of global carbon dioxide emission comes from cement industry. So how can you actually find the material, something similar to cement, or maybe use it as a filler and then reduce the use of synthetic cement, add water and sand, which you need sand, cement, water gives you what? Concrete, basically. So you're, what you're trying to do here, we're trying to come up with uh, you know, carbon material in, in the form of biochar uh, from different biomass you can use, uh, and then use the carbon material as a filler and blend with sand and cement and you produce concrete and then look at the test, you know, mechanical testing, absorption, you know, conductivity, et cetera. So we'll talk about all those things today. <clears throat> so um, just to give you again some background, you know, we know that uh, there is a need uh, for uh, alternative materials that can actually decrease uh, our carbon footprint, uh, and so so that it can save energy um, through uses of different materials, and basically that will permanently sequester carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide in the construction and uh, construction sector, and also it will promote reusability. Now, if you look at the first bullet point here, the use of concrete in the last thirty years, or twenty twenty, not last thirty years, you know, twenty twenty to twenty fifty. It's been projected or estimated to increase, and cumulative emission is going to go high up to 4.4 gigaton. I mean, if you talk about the energy consumption, it is always increasing with the population coming up, different parts of the world, uh, three to four global greenhouse gas emissions. You know, is actually energy consumption accounts for that. Then also one thing people they don't realize, you know, to be able to produce, you know, concrete, you use sand. Now, excessive digging of sand, of course, you know, it's going to destruct the environment, degradation of the coastal environment. If you're getting the sand from the coast, you know, as you hear, you can see the pictures here uh, or the river and environment. And also, I don't know if you know in India, or also in, you know, I don't know, in Southeast Asian countries, probably in China too, there's a sand mafia is growing. So there's a lot of, you know, things going on, which is not good for the environment as well as for the uh, country. So how do you actually uh, get alternative material? Uh, maybe, can you use instead of using sand? Can you use something else instead of using synthetic cement? Can you use something else as a filler? So there's a potential to sequester nearly about five gigaton of carbon per year. If you have 10% of the you know, world biomass transform into charcoal. That is according to a study done by Metrovic in 2011. Uh, what, which is quite significant, I, I, th I think so. Uh, and also biochar uh, has the potential to increase the energy efficiency of construction material. And also uh, the hypothesis is also that thermal conductivity also can be reduced. So you want to uh, produce a material and that will have less thermal conductivity. So what is the overarching objective? So the overarching objectives of our work is to basically come up with uh, a biochar cement mortar, uh, like a less dense composite material, uh, which will have low thermal conductivity, but yet it will have a very good strength, sufficient strength, if you like, uh, just like the conventional concrete, uh, so that you can meet the you know, requirement for structural requirement. Uh, and also the whole uh, system or the process uh, can be energy efficient. So there are certain properties in biochar which make them favorable for this particular work. Biosol is tough, uh, dense cement and sand, uh, because um, we have done a lot of studies on biosol, small biosol particle using nano indentation. Uh, so applying a micro, you know, Newton load and look at the displacement, we found that biosol is quite tough actually, if you look at individual biosol particle. Uh, of course, biosol is, you know, light in density, uh, reduced density, so biosol is porous particles, so therefore you have less dense than sand. And of course, the conductivity. Biochar is low thermal conductive material. So often, biochar are also used for insulation um, material. So these are some of the favorable properties uh, that you can, uh, uh, because of that, we apply biochar onto uh, biochar cement motors. So what we did is we you can produce biochar from different types of biomass. Everybody knows that. I mean, we had access to poultry litter and the poultry liter biochar we produced using just a uh, simple uh, poultry liter uh, using slow pyrolysis. Uh, temperature was about 450. Then what we did, 
we actually try to enhance the quality of the biochar by adding some other things like you know we use bentonite clay formic acid basal salt so that it is compatible as building material so so what we did we named it as enhanced poultry litter <clears throat> so this is basically uh, uh enhanced poultry litter uh the sand and cement you know uh, size, particular size. Uh, it's basically the average size of the cement, sand, and biochar. They find to be roughly about, you know, I think it was uh, for cement, it was about eight, eight micron, and for uh, sand, it was about 312 micron, and for biochar, it was about 26 micron. So the properties, uh, we looked at the chemical composition of the biochar uh, using ICPMS, uh, silica, calcium, ion potassium, you also, it is very important to look at the filler that you're going to be using for this kind of work. If it has got silica or silica fume, it can be very good. In fact, we are now doing some work with rice husk uh, biochar, uh, because rice husk contains a lot of silica fume, so which is good. So it gives the, a lot of strength for the motors that you have seen generate. So elemental analysis, when we did, uh, these are the elemental analysis uh, values, uh, you know, HC, aromatic ratios, uh, briefly about 0.25, so that indicates a high stability of the material. So how we did the mix design? So we had the plain cement mortar. Uh, overall, during the mix design process, we basically added water uh, in the you know range of you know cement to water uh, ratio about 0.5. Uh, water to binder ratio is 0.5 uh, for the control without biochar. Uh, to about roughly 0.65, depending on how much biosar actually basically you add. And the sand was replaced with biosar on uh, different weight basis, 10%, 20%, 40%, and then we made the blocks. And then they were designated as you know B0, means no biochar there, 10% biochar, 20% biochar, and 40% biochar. Very simple mixed design. So now once you make the blocks, uh, you need to basically test them, right? So once you do the motors, hardened motors, we do a lot of different tests. So we do mechanical testing, uh, test for durability, and also look, we wanted to look at the mechanisms inside, what actually happens, why it becomes you know, very tough, or how come the composite strength goes up, you know, how come, uh, what sort of you know, role you know, actually inside the pores of the biochar they play. And so we also wanted to look at the microcomputer computer tomography analysis. Uh, we did that, which is quite expensive actually for the samples to do, but nevertheless, we had to do that. Then also we did a bit of calculation about how does the carbon dioxide footprint if you use biochar in you know, cement motors. So in terms of mechanical strength, we looked at compressive strength and flexural strength. Uh, to our durability studies, we looked at basically uh, thermal conductivity. We also did the water absorption and voids, and then uh, also look at the density, density, bulk dry density. So these are some of the tests that we conducted in the uh, hardened motors that we uh, made using different, you know, mixed design. <clears throat> so let's look at some results and discussion. So the cube size were basically uh, 40 by 40, 160 millimeter, not very big. Uh, there were three replicates we did. Um, so this is basically a plot of uh, flexural strength in megapascal as a function of how much bias you basically add here. Uh, so, and this is the uh, this is the highest of the flexural strength we found for about 6.3 megapascal for uh, by a sample that where we added 20% biochar, which is actually 26% higher than the control which is roughly about, this is about control. No bias, which is about 0.02 megapascal. But for here, 20% addition, it kept on increasing, but at 40%, uh, it actually decreased. So uh, why it decreased, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about that. So overall, so when the cracks were encountered, you can see that this is scanning electron micrograph image. When the cracks were encountered with these bias particles, the crack basically uh, leads to different smaller, finer crack path that basically pass through some weaker zones. That's our hypothesis. So this crack deviation may be uh, one of the likely reasons why uh, increased material involvement in the surface testing or fracture surface testing can actually lead to an increase in the toughness of the composites. So for example, here a CM image, you see 
um, uh, flexor that passing through the biochar uh, particle for B10. So this was basically for B10 is SDM. And as the crack basically meets the biochar particles, so you can see a flexor line here, and it requires uh, sort of additional energy to basically break the carbon particle, then breaking the cement and sand particle. So that is our another hypothesis. Uh, and also the decrement that you see here, you see here decrease, decrement in, at 40% addition of biochar is most likely due to the excessive pores because if you apply more biochar, that means you know pores, it will be more porous, right? So the pores created by the biochar particle probably would have uh, led to the decrease in the flexural strength. So when you looked at the composite strength, uh, that is another one. Uh, for composite strength, uh, if you look at this strength uh, in y-axis as a function of you know addition of different addition of biochar. Now the size cube size is slightly different here. It's 50 by 50 by 50. Again, number of samples uh, we again did three replicates, and uh, here composite strength uh, control was quite high. You know, 43 megapascal, but with addition of 34 percent. Uh, by 10% biochar, 20% biochar, you can see a decrease in the uh, composite strength. Now, uh, uh, one thing is important to look at the water which is present in, bio, in pores of the biochar actually can actually can act as a nucleation site of hydration product. Therefore, it you know basically makes the denser composite at low biochar doses. But however, beyond a certain proportion of biochar doses, you know, like beyond 20 or 30, the volume occupation of the hydration products in the pores, they will become actually less than the pore size of the biochar. So that therefore this could make the, the composite that you produce uh, more porous instead of denser if you add more biochar. So that will basically decrease the strength uh, for all the mixes. That's, that's, that's why we see that decrease in all the uh, different addition of biochar. So that's uh, another explanation. Now, as the aging process, okay, as the aging progress, the additional water that is present in the biochar released the water slowly. That's again our explanation. So therefore, when it releases the water, what happens? It leaves the voids in place, which could possibly lead to decrease in strength, okay? So that is why we see this decrease in composite strength, unlike in flexural strength, when you see increase by the addition of biochar. <clears throat> now, when you look at oil, we also looked at the bulk dry density. Now, this is bulk dry density as a function of, you know, different percent of biochar and control, and control, which is nearly about, it was a 1900, <clears throat> uh, about uh, something like that, very close to, uh, to 2000 kilogram per cubic meter. So control, no biochar here. And this is 10%, 20%, and 40%. You can see as you add biochar, uh, bulk dry density basically decreased. So decrease in the bulk density can be actually directly related to an increase in the voids. Of course, you know, you, more biochar you add, more uh, voids you'd expect in the uh, block. So as the envelope density of biochar, you know, sort of lies between, I think about 0.25 gram per cc to 0.6 gram per cc, which is actually less than cement. Cement's density is roughly about uh, about 1.44 gram per cc or 1440 kilogram per cubic meter, or, or uh, even for sand, it is similar or even higher. Uh, so overall bulk density of the composite therefore decrease. So this is a good thing. So if you add biochar, you want to make the materials lighter, but yet it will have better strength, better toughness. And also if the thermal conductivity is low, that's even better than you know making a sand, cement, water, concrete by using synthetic cement than rather than to, uh, therefore we need to use different types of filler materials, something like biochar, which is good for us. <clears throat> then also we looked at the uh, water absorption and voids. Uh, here you see uh, percentage uh, in y-axis as a function of biochar for voids and the water absorption. So you can see here, the size of the block that we used for this test was about 40, 40, 160 millimeter. Again, the method that we followed American standard testing materials, C, C64213. So we, all the methods that we use, we basically followed American standard testing materials in a different protocol. Now, what you see here, 
the the increasing trend observed in the, you can see the voids increasing, water absorption increasing. So this increasing trend observed in the voids, we attribute that to the decreased compressive strength. Yeah, we've already seen this one, right? Compressive strength is decreasing. <clears throat> Here it is increasing. Because the biosphere percentage was increased, we're increasing the biosphere percentage. One likely explanation is that the porous biosphere particle didn't quite actually facilitate the creation of a denser surface, rather increase the uh, sort of capillary pores, which may have actually led to the higher water absorption. That is another uh, explanation for us. And also uh, biosphere has got high water retention capacity, we all know that. So it can easily absorb uh, more water and hold more water. So therefore, you know, it basically leads to higher water absorption of the composites. <coughs> now, it is also important that you know, thermal conductivity is uh, an extremely important property uh, which needs to be measured. Uh, here, this plot basically shows you the thermal conductivity uh, as a function of you know, addition of different percentages of biochar. Uh, so the, in, if you look at the thermal conductivity, how does it work actually? The main principle is that uh, some part of the supplied heat, okay? You're talking about temperature here, right? So some part of the supplied heat uh, is absorbed by the sample or the block, and the rest of the sample basically causes a temperature rise at the sensor surface. You know, you have sensors. So, and then thermal conductivity can be easily uh, determined by this equation, where it's basically fusivity is basically the uh, square root of the product of the, the thermal conductivity, the bulk density, and the heat capacity. So, if you look at here, at sample uh, B10 or uh, B0, oh no, B10, uh, it exhibits the lowest thermal conductivity as compared to the control 20% and 40% addition, okay? So it is roughly about 0.47 or 0.48 uh, roughly, and which is nearly about 26% less than the control. Control is nearly about 0.6, you know, four, three or four. So it is uh, at 10%, it was about 26%, uh, 26.2% uh, 26 less than the control. But again, when we added 20% biochar, it kept on increasing close to 60. And then eventually it got at 40%, it went to about 0.7. Now, the addition of biochar perhaps seemed to have a positive influence on the decreasing thermal conductivity of the composite. And we attribute that to the addition of less thermally conductive biochar particle. Okay, because time, biochar particles are thermally less conductive and therefore it kind of enhances the porosity of the cement matrix. So beyond a certain dose, beyond 20% or 40%, an increase in thermal conductivity was also observed. We found that and maybe that is to do to do the more conductive pathways which was created by biochar particles and therefore it reduced the thermal resistance uh, within the cement matrix. <clears throat> So we also did X-ray microcomputer tomography. Uh, these are some of the binary images and regions of interest. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the principles of microcomputer tomography. Uh, so here, this process basically involves uh, scanning the sample, constructing an image, and then you manage the data. So basically a sample is, uh, you can see here, this is a detector, this is the X-ray source, this is the sample. Uh, sample is basically mounted uh, on the 360 degree rotating platform. And then you pass through an X-ray uh, beam, this projected on the sample. And then as the image is made to rotate, so this sample basically rotates 360 degree rotation. So as the sample is made to rotate at a fixed determined angle and time, you have a two dimensional projections of the image and that can be actually recorded on the plane detector here. So this is the two dimensional image you know, we're getting. Then you look at which region is basically of interest to you. Then you look at the binary image, then you basically uh, you know, look at the data management. So in image construction step in here, the image of all 360 degree scans are reconstructed. Now we use a, I mean, there's a particular algorithm which is in here, uh, inherent within the computer tomography machine. And that basically comprises a uh, three-dimensional grid of different volumetric pixels with different color brightness uh, values according to the 
density of the material that you basically scan. <clears throat> so the gray region basically. So the here you see uh, this is just a you know X-ray microcomputer tomography you know machine here you see. And I'm not going to go through. It takes about quite a long time. Take about four hours, eight minutes, for forty seconds, sec, uh, sec, forty six seconds for a complete scan. Four hours you have to scan basically this one. Uh, and then there are you know program, uh, different engines that we use to construct the image. And you take different slices. We took about fourteen hundred seventy two slices for each individual sample, which were reconstructed. <coughs> so what do you see here? Uh, this is basically uh, X-ray microcomputed uh, tomography, uh, different color images. Uh, the gray region that you see, that basically represents hardened cement paste with voids. So I've written here the voids. So this gray region represents the hardened cement void paste with voids uh, represented as black region. This black you see here, everywhere this little, little black, these are basically voids, nothing's there. <clears throat> now, as you add biochar, as the bias percentage is increased, there is an obvious color contrast. You can see how it changes to change the color. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, when you add this, by when you add different uh, percentage of biochar, uh, different color changes, and in the images that are obtained, and one of the possible reason is that could be the absorption of X-rays we are obtained, uh, X-rays that we got. They were uh, because of the water molecules, absorption of the X rays of water molecules. Uh, this could be attributable to the biochar particles, uh, which will have high, uh, which will basically hold more water because biochar has got higher retention capacity than cement and sand. Uh, the color was basically coded um, according to the densities, uh, varying from low dense, represented dark, dark blue, dark blue, you see here. This one is the dark blue. So the color was coded according to the densities, uh, varying from low dense representing dark blue uh, to high dense representing uh, like, you know, you could see orange, uh, red and yellow zones. So the low dense regions can be considered as potential voids, uh, white high dense region that you see here. Uh, they basically represents hydrated or unhydrated cement uh, paste. So sometimes this sort of uh, images are very difficult to actually interpret. Uh, you have to be very careful actually how you actually interpret and what does that mean. <clears throat> now, here you see the X-ray computer tomography 2D porosity for uh, biochar uh, 40 percent and biochar zero, and this is um, two-dimensional uh, porosity values here. Uh, it is for control 2.49, uh, 20 percent, and BC, see, as you add more biochar, the porosity, two-dimensional, three-dimensional porosity, you can see quite high. And these are the basic black and white images here. So an explanation of the, these findings, basically, uh, from microcomputer tomography analysis, um, can be found in the relationship of particles of biochar and hydration during curing process, because curing is very important. Now, we have hypothesized that biochar particles acted as a filler particles, in this whole you know, system at lower addition as volume occupation of the hydrogen products uh, basically filled in the pores and was comparable to the actual size of the pores. And at, when you have high doses of biochar, like 30%, 40% biochar, the volume occupation of the hydrogen products was partially filled with, uh, filled in the pores and was evenly distributed uh, through the whole samples. So this is scanning electric, uh, electron micrograph and EDS analysis. And also we looked at uh, the hydration product, which I basically just now explained. Uh, and uh, for you can basically look at, at the interfacial region, uh, what actually happens. Uh, so uh, it is this, these data are important in the, in the explanation of the uh, whole uh, mechanisms, why you see higher strength, why you see uh, lower strength, why you see higher water absorptions, and also density actually, you know, of course, you, know, you cannot use this data to explain your uh, lowering the density. That's to do with the, you know, por porous nature of the biochar particle. <clears throat> so what we did, uh, we also looked at a bit of uh, environmental significance of the work. Um, so what we did, we decided to take 100 square meter area uh, with a standard about 
12 millimeter thickness of mortar plastering. It was taken as a practical example so that you can calculate the carbon dioxide emission. I mean, for cement, you would know that uh, to produce one kilogram of cement, you basically emit 1.002 kilogram of carbon dioxide. For sand, it is so much for every kilogram of sand, so much carbon dioxide is, which is not much, a little. And then for biochar, one kilogram of biochar, this is a carbon negative. This is 0.49 kilogram of carbon dioxide. So here basically it gives you a net carbon dioxide emission uh, as a function of biochar. Here you have uh, zero or control, which is about 508. 10%, 20%, 30%, 20% and 40%, you can see a steady reduction in net carbon dioxide emission as we added biochar as a filler in our motors. So the net emissions basically decrease from 508 kilogram for control to all the way to 405 kilogram for 40% uh, addition, which accounts to nearly about 20% decrease from if you compare to control. <clears throat> so um, to these things, all these things were calculated using simple X, uh, Excel spreadsheet calculation. Uh, I'm not going to show you the Excel spreadsheet calculation, how we did, but basically I wanted to uh, take you through what we did here. Uh, we had the design mix, as I said before, we had the zero, uh, B0, which is the control. Uh, we had 10%, 20%, 40% biochar. Uh, these are the materials, sand, cement, and biochar. Uh, how many parts of cement, sand, and biochar is used? This is control, okay? Uh, and then biochar density, as you can see, it's very low, 580 kilogram per cubic meter or 0.58 gram per cc. Carbon dioxide equivalent is, you know, per kilogram of biochar, you basically minus 0 0.49. And for 10%, 20%, and 40%, these are the quantity, density, quantity in kilogram, and the carbon dioxide in a per kilogram equivalent. And then this is in a total, in, a, in so many kilograms. Now, if you look at here, 40%, uh, sorry, 20% also here, the quantity that we used was about um, 0.685 cubic meter. And uh, here we had about, a biosar was 0.17. So all the uh, percentages of biosar changed, 0 0.085 to you know, 0 0.17 to 0 0.34, uh, 0 0.34. Now, if you look at here, uh, let me just see. Yeah, this one here, <coughs> when you use 40% biochar, as, I, as you can see here, 40% biochar, there was a deduct, reduction of nearly 20% from the control, the net carbon dioxide emission. And that is reflected here in this calculation here. So here we have the biochar, you know, minus 97.44, which is the highest, you know, normally for biochar, which was taken for as a minus 0.49. Uh, which is basically so many kilogram of carbon dioxide emission, negative carbon dioxide emission per production of per kilogram of biochar. <clears throat> but here you see minus 97.44. That means more biochar you add, you're basically sequestering more and your uh, carbon net carbon dioxide emission becomes smaller and smaller. So in summary, I want to conclude that the toughness of the composites of the blocks that we produced using biochar as a filler at different percentage ratio of a different percent uh, biochar, uh, basically increased to 20% with the replacement of you know, <coughs> uh, sand uh, with biochar, 20% uh, biochar. Overall, density of the cement motors also decreased uh, to nearly 20% with the addition of 40% biochar when you look at the thermally less conduct, when you look at the conductivity test, we found that thermally less conductive biochar sand cement motors could be easily obtained with 10% sand replacement with biochar. And that is nearly a uh, reduction of nearly 26% and then the control, which did not have any biochar. So overall, we found that there was uh, reduced emissions with addition of biochar in cement composites. So this is all good, but as I said at the beginning, it is always good to do something in the lab uh, we can, uh, the proof of concept, you can demonstrate in the lab, but how practical is this one if you want to scale it up at a larger scale, say pilot scale, if you want to make big block. But again, you must remember, the motors that we made here, they're small. The strength that you see, they're not very high. So you have to remember for what purpose you're going to be using the concrete for. 
Is it going to be paving material? So paving material, it does not have to withstand a lot of weight in it, right? You know, garden paving or driveways, but you're not talking about a building, you know, building uh, blocks or something. And for that, you have to have, you know, much higher strength for the concrete. So it depends on your purpose. So we are now talking to a couple of uh, companies here. They have shown interest. So we are actually trying to take our lab uh, findings uh, to a little bit in you know, a bigger scale uh, to do some pilot uh, scale studies uh, in the company's uh, office, like in the lab, they have their own setup uh, or we can, we, our students are going to go and do some work. So that is basically in the pipeline right now. And also there are some of my other students are uh, looking at, you know, developing uh, binder uh, for asphalt. Uh, asphalt binder, like using biosurge and asphalt binder uh, to increase the rot resistance, etc. So as a roading material. So I think I will end my talk here. It's the, now it is 35 minutes I talk. So I'd like to just thank uh, my PhD student Sai Pranit, who is submitting his thesis soon. Uh, there are a couple of you know honor students, Laureen and Maria. They graduated and they're working for different company. And Dane Garnike, who actually was the technician at our University of Auckland X-ray microcomputer tomography lab. He was a facility manager. He helped us to do the analysis. Uh, analysis is okay. You know, if you know how to use the machine, that's fine. But the biggest problem with, you know, all these kind of samples when you get the image, it's the, how you actually interpret your data. So you have to be very careful what you interpret, how you interpret. So it was not that very easy. Anyway, uh, so I hope I made some sense, you know, talking about, you know, using bias as a filler in um, producing a mortar or concrete block. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Saran. Uh, now we come to the Q&A section. Uh, is there any questions? Yes, I have one uh, question, if it is possible. Um, uh, question is uh, the following. The cost of production of one ton of BHR, how, is, uh, how much is the cost? Uh, I didn't understand. What did you say? Cost of products? Oh, yeah, yes, uh, BHR is uh, artificial, uh, artificial uh, mm. material, and yeah, we yeah. need to produce that one. The price of uh, production of one uh, ton of BHR, how much? Yeah, yeah, I think if you look at the literature, I mean, globally, there is no uh, fixed cost for production of BHR, because BHR you can produce different ways. You can use slow pyrolysis, fast pyrolysis, fast carbonization, gasification, hydrothermal carbonization. It depends how you produce, whether you have the biomass available with you, easily available, and uh, how much energy you use. So there is no fixed cost for production of biosar, although for a soil amendment, I think they were, I mean, the, the biosar that we produce, this was produced in our lab, so we haven't done any calculation in terms of the cost of biosar production. In fact, we are going to be doing for the company now because they want to know that if they have to use the biochar as filler material in concrete or producing block, they want to do a life cycle analysis also the, of the whole process. So we are in the process of actually trying to determine how much would it cost if we want to produce maybe tons of biochar with a, from a particular biomass. But uh, for this work, we have the samples available and we did not look at the cost. No, maybe you can, uh, maybe you know about average cost because when we use any materials, we need to uh, know its, its cost, its price. Yeah, so, I think for, for this, this biochar that we produce. Average, this average estimation. <laughs> I think prob probably, I think probably, I mean, they, for one kilogram of biochar, probably we are looking at about you know two or three dollars only. One, one kilogram, kilogram two dollars. Only one or two, yeah, one or two dollars only. 
that is New Zealand, not New Zealand dollars, American dollars. So two American dollars is roughly a what? You're talking of 295 uh, American dollars. So which is roughly about uh, maybe $3 something New Zealand. Because what we do, we already have the pilot plan. So when you ask about the cost, are you talking about the cost of just producing or cost of the plant, design, everything? Then the cost becomes different. Is it the cost of the material or is it the cost of the whole process of producing biochar? Someone can bump from mm -hmm. Yes, if uh, one kilogram, uh, the price of one kilogram is uh, two American dollars, one ton, two thousand dollars, one ton. Yes. Of biochar. Oh. oh, very expensive, very expensive. Second. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it will be expensive. Yeah. So because, so I mean, it depends how you're going to be using it. But if you're going to be using as, you know, uh, soil amendment, probably you can even make it cheaper. It depends how you, this particular biochar, we had to produce from poultry liter, and we had to add certain, you know, basil dust, bentonite clay, and they cost money. <coughs> so this is, this is just a proof of concept that we wanted to look at in the laboratory, but we are not going to be using this. But if you're going to be using for bigger scale, probably we'll be looking at rice husk biochar, which is cheaper to uh, produce. And also rice husk has got a lot of silica fume, which is very good for making a good concrete block. No, the question was, when we are using any um, uh, structural materials, we need uh, to estimate uh, the efficiency of the- uh, Yeah, the sure. Thank you. May I ask some question, please? Um, uh, yes. I want to ask regarding the thermal conductivity. You know, uh, yes. I don't understand uh, the relationship between the flexural and uh, strength characteristics because uh, while you are adding biochar and increasing mm. the percentage, the density, dry density decrease that mm. explains how it behaves. Uh, however, regarding the thermal conductivity, I don't understand why at 10% it drops. Uh, probably, I think, uh, probably some chemical process were ongoing by the time. Yes. What apparatus did you uh, measure it? Because you know why I'm asking? I did lots of tests with thermal conductivity apparatus and sometimes it gave me also some weird numbers, uh, which is unexplainable and were mm. difficult to make a pattern. So exactly. Time. So yeah, I just exactly. guess probably there are some unfinished chemical process were ongoing. That is why it dropped because at ten percent it should be correlated to the density, and mm. the density decrease, uh, but it's still high. It's still higher, ten percent. It should be higher. Mm -hmm. That's why. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I. We myself don't know. Our explanation was that, um, you know, we found at B10, uh, it showed the lowest thermal conductivity, which is actually about 0.47 or something, uh, which is nearly 26 percent less, which is quite significant. As if you look at the 20, uh, 40 percent. Uh, which was quite high, which is nearly 10% higher than the control sample. If you look at, you know, uh, this one here, the 40%, okay? So this is quite high. So it, it's very difficult to, I think you were probably right, there's something else going on there, we don't know. Uh, but uh, it has to be do, it has to do with something with the density, because density is important in terms of uh, your uh, thermal conductivity measurement because you know density needs to be taken into account, heat capacity needs to be taken into account, and also the thermal conductivity that gives you the effusivity. And the test that we did in this particular um, work uh, for control 10%, 20%, and 40%, maybe I think we should have repeated. We did not quite repeat uh, this one. Uh, that could have been another factor, uh, artifacts or maybe there could be something else happening. Uh, I don't have- How many samples did you test at the time? <laughs> uh, we did only for three samples. Okay, so you got the average, the mean value, yeah? Mean, mean value. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. 
hello, uh, Professor Sharma. Uh, I think yeah. there was one question from one participant. Uh, I think Mr. Mr. Raghu. Mr. Raghu, are you there? So he asked about uh, the void ratio. He asked uh, generally the increased void ratio is supposed to increase water absorption, but mm. here it is not like that. Can you yeah. explain? Uh, which which is you talking about the void ratio, right? Yeah, void, void ratio is supposed to increase water absorption, water absorption, but here it is not like that. So I mean, this his question is what? Why about void ratio is basically? We can see it is uh, mm -hmm. increasing water absorption, increasing and void is increasing. Is it is it the one? What is he talking about? Yeah, yeah. He he wanted to he wanted some explanation related to it. Yeah, yeah because biosphere has got high water retention capacity. It can hold more water. It is more porous, so obviously it's going to absorb more. Okay. okay. So if you if you look at the increasing trend that you see here in this, uh, here if you see the increasing trend here, this increasing trend observed in the voids, control 10, 20, 30, 40, it is increasing. I mean, we have attributed this to the decreased compressive strength as the biosphere percentage was increased. Because you we saw decreased compressive strength because voids were increasing, so that's why we saw that it can be correlated with the compressive strength as the biosphere was uh, added. So one explanation is that if when you have a biosphere particle which is highly porous, they don't somehow facilitate the creation of more dense surface, and rather it increases the capillary pores. Capillary pores probably will be increasing, which may actually lead to higher water absorption. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks. Uh, and Professor Asker? Uh, uh, I don't know, it's good morning, good afternoon, evening for everybody. A very good presentation. Thank you for uh, uh, Mr. Ajit Shah. Shah. Yes. So it's uh, very interesting. So my question is, uh, it is a real big work and big research and uh, I understand you have very good results. So who financially support of this research and uh, where you will be use of your results, where? Oh, what good question. Some, yeah. Maybe some, uh, uh, this was, future. yeah, this is my own funding actually. Um, yeah, student, I have a student uh, who came from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT. Uh, he's doing a PhD, he got a doctoral scholarship and those students who get doctoral scholarship, they are given funding by the university for consumables and to do experiments. And uh, we have uh, some concrete companies here, uh, paving company, uh, they are supporting that work. And so they want us to actually uh, do this test, you know, like, you know, what we did uh, to basically replicate it at a bigger scale uh, so that, you know, they can actually make good permeable pavers for rain garden or, you know, often because for those pavers, uh, the you know, strength does not have to be that strong, you know, so the strength that you obtain here is good enough. So we are talking about talking with those companies. In fact, I have a meeting with them on Monday uh, to talk about, but most likely we will be uh, using uh, different types of biomass, not poultry litter. Poultry litter was just available with us. That's why we just used it as an example uh, for this work. But we are going to be using uh, rice husk biosar because rice husk biosar has got a lot of silica fuel and it can actually help to make a very good you know, concrete block with high greater toughness, uh, strength will increase. So we have found some preliminary studies on that as well. This company in New Zealand? New Zealand, yeah, New Zealand company. My second question is maybe a little bit different for this topic. So I look in New Zealand, not so many infection people there, very few number. Pardon? Not many? Very, very few number of infection, infection people per day. Infection. What people? 19. What people? Uh, who is uh, have some problem of 
with the COVID, COVID-19, COVID, you know? You oh, COVID-19, COVID-19, yes. no, no, so COVID-19. Not so many people. Not yeah, many not many people, people. only it's, it's 5 million. Number. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, we have only 5 million people here. So uh, it's uh, okay so far. I mean, uh, we are surviving and uh, main problem here in New Zealand is uh, people coming from overseas when they're tested at the airport, if they get COVID, they have to go straight away into uh, Manus uh, facility. They will not be allowed to come out after two weeks only they can come out. Doesn't matter you're coming from US, UK, China, India. Now they have banned people coming from India because in India COVID has gone up. So international flight is work now. International airport is work, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is work now, da? International airport. Auckland, yeah, it's many in Auckland. Many flights is coming, right? Many flights is coming. Many, many mm -hmm. flights coming, uh, many flights coming, but uh, only for people who live in New Zealand, only citizen and resident, not tourists. Tourists cannot come here. Because we want in future maybe uh, reserve, reserve some land. land. So yes, sure. So some underground space and bunker, like bunker. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, make some security from COVID because COVID will be maybe a long time, maybe until 2015, uh, 2025, I don't know, 2030. Yeah, maybe, no, nobody know. knows, exactly, you're right. So please reserve for this... us some land for us, some land. Mm. I think this could, this could become, a, a, what do you call, a reality in life, you know, we might have to live with COVID. Uh, everybody talks about it. My students ask, I have a lot of students who haven't been able to come from overseas because of the COVID. They got stuck, they got scholarship, they can't come. They have enrolled from overseas. But what to do? At least we have Zoom or Vivo or other things. You know, if there were no Zoom, nothing, you know, then you would not be doing anything. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, is there uh, any other question? Uh, maybe I will uh, like to ask some. So, I mean, thanks professor for this wonderful presentation. And I think it's very interesting application uh, that uh, Professor Sarma is exploring on use of biochar for making concrete uh, for some particular application, specifically what you mentioned about uh, paving uh, material, like in, for rain gardens. You know, I think it's very similar uh, concept there is in China also. I think Professor Sarma mm -hmm. might be knowing sponge sponge. Yeah, I, I, I have a project with uh, Zhejiang University. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so Tao, Jiang Tao. So I, we have published papers in construction and building mm -hmm. materials. Uh, this paper is also already published in construction and building materials. If you're interested, I can send a copy of this to you. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to know about this uh, production process because I think there are a number of factors involved, like pyrolysis temperature, uh, mm. biomass type. Uh, mm. As you mentioned. Uh, as far as we know that uh, if you, your biochar produced from uh, specifically like if you have produced from plant waste or it's from animal waste, uh, mm. they could give very uh, contrasting kind of uh, exactly. functionality. Yeah. yeah. So mm. uh, what do you expect if we use from, uh, because from plants and also the shape of particles, I think when we mm. produce the mm. shape of particles or the size will also influence the strength. Mm. that you are preparing this concrete mix design. Mm. So what do you expect when we want to use rice husk biochar? Um, yeah, because uh, rice husk biochar, if you look at rice husk, it has got a lot of silica in it. So the silica fume plays a big role. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have silica fume in your uh, cement, sand and water, <coughs> or reduce, you know, cement use, you know, biochar produced from silica fume. Silica mm -hmm. fume can actually play a big role in terms of improving its, you know, strength. So that is one of the reasons why we want to use silica fume. So the one we use this one, this was not a good biomass, but still we got, you know, interesting results. Uh, we we also using corn stover uh, with the project in Zhejiang University, and we looked at the carbon dioxide. We basically pump carbon dioxide into the concrete, then we let it cure and then uh, look at the strength, et cetera. But we are now thinking of using rice husk biochar. We are going to use a lignocellulosic biochar, mainly uh, pine sawdust, because sawdust mm -hmm. is also very good. 
So we have a lot of sawdust in New Zealand because New Zealand produces a lot of pines and you know we export quite a lot of pine overseas. Uh, so we are going to be using rice husk, sawdust to compare against corn stubble and uh, one liter we use. I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, results we are going to get, but uh, my mm -hmm. feeling, gut feeling is that because of the presence of a lot of silica oxide uh, in the um, silica fume in uh, rice husk biochar, we are going to see uh, even better improved results than what we have found so far. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to know very, like for example, if we take rice husk biochar, what uh, pyrolysis temperature, because we mm. know there they could be two extremes, at least uh, yeah. like we are in your porosity is very less at low pyrolysis <clears throat> temperature. And if you have very high pyrolysis temperature, your porosity will increase. But at the same mm -hmm. time, your surface functionality decreases. Uh, yeah, I mean, the surface functionality is important. Uh, I mean, we have done some studies uh, uh, for other work, like, you know, sometimes you use biochar produced at uh, low temperature biochars, which will have, you know, uh, temperature, say 450 degrees or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they will have lots of different functional groups, carboxyl, carbonyl, et cetera. But as you increase, the more and more volatiles will escape, it will become more porous. So we basically lose all the functional groups, but at the, in the process, it becomes high surface at high temperature. So uh, operating conditions plays an important role in production of biochar. So if you have biochar produced from rice husk, we are going to be doing 450, 550, 650, 750, mm -hmm. and maybe 850. So we want to see what is the optimum. Sometimes yes. what happens, what we have found out, if you keep on increasing, sometimes surface area even can go also drastically reduced. Mm -hmm. So that is very important when you do actually the pyrolysis and also what flow rate it is moving through the uh, cylinder and what kind of pyrolysis unit you have, and what is the water content, what is the original biomass, all those mm -hmm. things yeah. will actually play an important role. And one general uh, discussion I would not want to ask, because last before this pandemic, I, I was thinking to conduct a survey, uh, especially with local farmers or people working in landscape, I mean, companies. Mm. I mean, uh, want to understand how much biochar is being used in practice, like by farmers or... Uh, yeah, or we, I mean... We, so we did little bit in China before mm. pandemic but what we found that farmers i think some are aware of this material but they are not buying it I mean, they are not they are not or the material the way which is the way which is sold in the market the biochar it's not mm. they do not have specifications they yeah know. that's the problem i mean there is no stand i mean there is a international biochar initiative they have you know come up with standard uh, like for example if you want to analyze biochar you know, before people is to just look at the soil analysis, same technique mm -hmm. they would use for biochar, which is actually not right. But, you know, they have come up with a standard, but as such, you know, in terms of application of biochar for different purposes, for me, I see not all biochars are equal. Mm -hmm. So totally. if you apply biochar in New Zealand in soil mm -hmm. for agricultural production, mm -hmm. or if you apply that in China, same biochar, same condition, you apply different soils, that's, you're going to get different effects. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you have a fertile soil where you add biochar, you're not going to see any difference. Mm -hmm. Like I have a lot of projects, you know, my colleagues in Australia. Australia is a country, dry country, uh, soil is degraded. So they have mm -hmm. to apply a lot of fertilizer. In New Zealand, we do not use so much uh, mm -hmm. because the, for, it is volcanically derived soil. But if we want to use the same biochar in Australia and here in New Zealand, with same condition treatment effects and all you're trying to find out, but you will find different because mm -hmm. they will be two same biochar will be giving you different results when you apply in different soils. Mm -hmm. so also same time, same, same way, if you want to use a biochar and you need to make sure that I want to produce a, or design, design a biochar mm -hmm. with such properties that those properties are important for making this. Mm -hmm. I know I want to design a biochar to have these properties inherent in it so that mm -hmm. I can apply for this. So it depends. It depends on your purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe it's a long way to go till it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Biochar, the work has been going on for many years. People have been talking about, you know, reduction of greenhouse gas emission, 
and uh, so on and so forth. But you know, people have found contradicting results. A lot of thousands of papers have been written, but at the end of the day, uh, I think a lot of people, they have not come into consensus you know, about the uh, use of application of biosar or how commercially feasible is this product. We don't know yet. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank you, the organizer, uh, uh, for this. Uh, this is quite a very great initiative uh, by Ch Chinese government. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, nice to be able to interact with you all. And uh, hopefully, some days, some of you can uh, travel to our beautiful country. And then, yeah, and look forward to seeing you, some of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Professor. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor, for, for your interesting lecture. Okay. So, thank you, Professor Zhu. Yeah, thank you. Then bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was very bye -bye. interesting. Bye. 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 Yes, thank thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye, bye. bye. See you next time. See you next, next time, pull up. <laughs> you can come to New Zealand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to visit. I'd like to visit visit Eurasia. I never been there, so maybe I'm one day. <laughs> Inshallah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.